All right, hi everybody. Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for coming to the Zoom lecture. Uh, today we have Isomorphic Studio partners, Andy Chen and Vakasha Vade. I will introduce them and we can go ahead and hear about the awesome and important things they have for us today. If you guys ever have any questions during the lecture, go ahead and use the Q&A button down below and we will have a designated Q&A time at the end. So without further ado, uh, Task Week presents to you Andy Chen and Vakasha Vade from Isometric Studio, and they will share their recent work at the intersection of architecture, graphic design, and social justice. This includes visual identities, exhibition design projects, and signage programs for major educational and cultural clients, including Google, Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, Princeton University, and the Museum of the City of New York. The partners will discuss the opportunities and complexities associated with navigating this work as queer people of color, engaging with complex social issues, including gender equity, climate change, racial injustice, LGBT identity, and immigrant rights. So I will stop sharing my screen. And uh, Andy and Lucas, if you want to go ahead. Sure. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. My name is Bakas Andy. and uh, we're partners at Isometric Studio. And we're gonna go ahead and share our screen. So um, Isometric began about seven years ago. And here you're seeing a slide with kind of Andy's background. On the left is an image from Taiwan, from a fishing village. Um, that's where his parents immigrated to the United States. Uh, for, uh, that's where, yeah, from. And on the right, you're seeing kind of the visual culture of LA where Andy was born and grew up. And uh, I grew up mostly in Karachi, Pakistan and came to the United States in 2006 um, to go to college. And we met at Princeton University as undergraduates. And this is what we looked like back then. And as you can probably tell, we're in a personal relationship and we're also married to each other. And uh, so after studying sociology at Princeton, Andy um, um, did a Fulbright fellowship in London for a year at the Royal College of Art. Uh, he also got an MFA in graphic design from RISD. And uh, he worked at some prominent design studios like Pentagram with Paula Cher in New York and research studios in London. And when he was in grad school, he also started working with nonprofits to think about how people are represented in visual culture, how these institutions tell the stories of beneficiaries and how we can kind of flip that to show people as protagonists in their own stories. And meanwhile, I studied architecture in undergrad and then got a master's at Harvard. And uh, I interned at some really exciting offices as well. Um, Sana in Tokyo, OMA in Rotterdam, and also Skidmore Owings and Merrill in San Francisco, and then for my first kind of job in, in the New York office. But just a few months in, I left and there was an opportunity to work together with Andy and we were both in New York and uh, we started working on Isometric Studio together. This is what our studio looks like. We're a team of seven now and everybody's working remotely these days. And here's um, some logos of some of our clients. As you can see, there's a number of educational institutions, also museums and cultural institutions, and uh, some technology companies. And we have a two minute video kind of summarizing our recent work. I'm gonna go ahead and play that now.
So we're going to go ahead and share some case studies of some of our projects. And just to give you a sense of what the process looks like and you know what were the milestones uh, for our studio over the course of the last several years. So in 2014, when I first joined Andy, this was one of our first major projects. And it was a big enough project that we needed another team member. And so we went, you know, became kind of a real studio. It was for the US Agency for International Development. And it was under the Obama administration at that point. And the idea was to do an exhibition to show how American um, you know, innovation and research was making a difference in the developing world. And uh, we were approached by Andy's professor who was working with the USAID uh, with this diagram that they had so far, just kind of summarizing what they needed. And as you can see at the top, it says, exhibition, science, technology, innovation, and partnership to end extreme poverty. And that's what they wanted us to work on. But we were also a bit concerned that when you're talking about poverty around the world, um, it's a little strange to put like a lounge in the center. So we had some interest, we had some critiques and also some creative ideas. So the next day we took the Amtrak and went to DC to see the space. And you can see it's a 10,000 square foot room. It's the second largest government building in the United States after the Pentagon. And this is where the exhibit was to take place. And you can see it's quite um, distracting. It's postmodern architecture. So we were thinking about how do we work with a room like this in order to make sure that it doesn't look like a science fair of like projects and show something where people can really get a sense of the difference that American innovation was making. One of the examples of the client with us was called Design for the Other 90%. And uh, this was like a kind of a case study they wanted us to look at. And our concern or critique of this was that in order to show the prop, uh, the innovation, which is a water filtration system, they're using the woman almost as a crouching figure, almost as a prop. And we thought it wasn't very dignified. Like the photography was not very dignified. And also the use of really large and numerous um, you know, numbers and statistics also took away from the personal like individual stories of the people whose lives were being changed. And so we looked to art and architecture to think about other ways of doing this kind of uh, project. We looked to JR and seeing how putting really big images in spaces turns the gaze back on the viewer and complicates the relationship between you know, the, the the art and, and the viewer. And we wanted to see how we could kind of explore that a bit. We're also looking at language and branding. Like if you wanna, if you wanna uh, end extreme poverty, what is it that we want, right? So we came up with this visual concept, which they really loved. It had photojournalistic imagery from really renowned photographers, many of whom were from the developing world and had bold language. And it kind of started to tell the story of the work rather than just uh, you know, explaining the science behind it. And we also wanted to think about how, how do you get to extreme hope? You know, what are, how can we categorize this exhibit so that there are di digestible chunks that people can understand and take away and, and remember? So we came up with some uh, sample headings like equality. And within that, you can have digital inclusion, gender equality, resilience and rebuilding. And you can have nourishment as a category, health, knowledge. Um, we also started looking at spatially how this could be arranged. And one of the case studies we looked at was uh, Lina Bobardi, and this is her museum in Sao Paulo. And you can see that the art is arranged very methodically, but it allows the visitor to explore in many different ways. Like the paths of circulation here are endless. So you could kind of balance that freedom with organization without getting uh, chaos. And we showed them two options and they picked kind of a hybrid of the two, which involved these uh, super large panels that would tell these stories at a scale that was larger than life. And it, they would be hung from the ceiling. 
And the way that the graphic design worked, it, we advocated to start with the personal narrative of the people who were essentially collaborators and just given the opportunity, were able to really you know, change their communities around and then go into the technology and the partnerships and the logos and so forth. And here you can see an exonometric of the whole space showing partner stations at either end. This is where nonprofits could show their recent work. In the middle is the exhibit. And then we have some other programs as well, such as a stage for presentations. And then you can see images of the exhibit. Um, it, Hope was very closely associated with the Obama campaign. We want, wanted it to be nonpartisan, so they went with extreme progress. And you can see the partner stations that were modular in the back and the exhibit panels, the stage. And it was just very interesting because it was like transporting people to the different places where the impact was being felt and providing, you know, for members of Congress and for the nonprofit community, a look into the kinds of wonderful things that USAID was making possible. And so these are semi-translucent panels that are commonly used material in advertising and the hardware here is custom. So just taking stuff that already exists and repurposing it. Yeah, I mean, somewhere along the way, we became a studio that um, you know, does graphic design and branding, but started thinking about how uh, those can sort of create uh, spaces of belonging, particularly for minority communities and thinking about how the questions of dignity and inclusion explored in that first USAID project, which is one of the first collaborations between me and Vikas, um, I could extend into a whole like, sort of thesis about how uh, we could reinvent um, social spaces. And this project at Princeton University, which is our alma mater, is for the Carl A. Field Center for Equality and Cultural Understanding. And uh, so they approached us in uh, 2014? 15. 15. Yeah. Um, yeah, so where there was a speed of protests around the uh, the East Coast and particularly in schools. Across the country, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in reaction to sort of Trayvon Martin and Sandra Bland, a lot of uh, police uh, killings of um, mostly Black Americans. And uh, basically Black students felt like their voices weren't being heard and the history, racist history of the institution was not being sort of revealed or told. And instead we were celebrating uh, still uh, Woodrow Wilson, who was a former president of the United States and also president of um, the university and uh, enshrining his name in uh, the name of the public policy school and um, on the campus, instead of questioning whether or not that's still appropriate in an age where uh, you know, there's more truth telling. So they sat in the president's office and here's an image from Yale where students marched and said, we're here, we've been here, we ain't leaving, we are loved. And we interviewed students and photographed them and they said things like, we're environments like Princeton, the kinds of racism or discrimination that you experience will not be easily recognizable to you. And in fact, like priv privilege tends to cloak um, sort of racism in this shroud of, um, of genteel, uh, sort of um, you know, highfalutin um, Ivy League academic language, but it's always still there. And uh, part of the goal was to sort of figure out how to redress that racism through design. And so here um, on the left, we started by exploring images from the past here from the Memphis sanitation strike and thinking about typography that could be bold and strident. And also on the right, how that like sort of legacy of this language uh, lives on in protest posters that are made by hand. Um, here, we looked at images of uh, sort of art by Corita Kent, the idea of a tear that reveals a deeper condition. On the right, our friend Jared Key, who was a contemporary artist doing some of the same kind of operations, shows a typeface that had that sense of boldness and connection to the evidence of hand, but at the same time has a sense of warmth because it was being used for branding for a student center. And though we couldn't change the name, we focused on the large, uh, making large the, the values as to say equality, justice, freedom, and action. Um, sort of using that to create a typographic system uh, that had this idea of a frame or a cut um, and being able to uh, sort of use that as a window to look into people's experiences in the poster campaign here. To talk about white privilege and the various different identities that at a time felt suppressed. And then they, uh, the university invited us to think about the actual physical space of the center, which uh, was a former eating club that had been converted into a conference space. And it wasn't particularly bad, but students felt like, you know, most people didn't know that it existed on the periphery of campus. So it was pretty far from the center. And our goal was to figure out, well, how can we recenter 
you know, without changing the actual location of the space on the campus so that this could become a vibrant source of uh, political activism and, and for students to be able to express their identities in authentic ways. And they, students complained that the space kind of felt like a doctor's office. And so they hired an architect called Ballinger from Philadelphia to sort of redesign the space. And Ballinger was proposing African chairs and Asian pillows um, with like sort of dark walls all around. We were very alarmed by this. And we kind of had to approach the university and Ballinger and say that this kind of approach will only make students feel more essentialized. And uh, it's a kind of reductionist approach that um, basically makes the problem worse. And we don't we want to spare the university shame and embarrassment of sort of you know another protest uh, based around doing the wrong thing. So they gave us um, some thought. They gave us some thought, and then they said, "Well, what would you do?" And we proposed basically applying the language, the graphic language of the identity to the walls of the space, and made models to sort of show that idea. And here it is installed. Um, uh, it was divided into three zones. As you enter the center. Um, basically the words we're here with a space that's automatically seated on the walls for student posters and interaction. On the right, an image of Dr. Carl Fields, who students didn't know who he was, nobody really did. But he's the first black uh, dean of an Ivy League school, a huge accomplishment and the namesake of the center. On the left, uh, the mission statement of the center sort of uh, abbreviated um, and sort of made large here to acknowledge and question race, class, privilege, and culture at Princeton and beyond. As you enter the center, images of students in protest or collaborating and celebrating together, mourning together. Above the water fountains and bathrooms, which are still a site of contest, everyone should feel welcome in every space at Princeton. Graphics sort of flood the space with color, typography. The second um, room we've been here is a snapshot of the history of people of color at Princeton and their allies. Instead of doing a linear timeline, which might get boring after time, thinking about like sort of these moments and heroes um, from past and present, for example, on the left, uh, Sonia Sotomayor, the um, Supreme Court Justice, and on the right, Daniel Padilla Peralta, who was an undocumented immigrant from the Dominican Republic who became a salutatorian of his class and a professor at the university. The final room, We Are Loved, uh, which is a social space that's marked by quotations of and the words of people of color and um, sort of putting them into the space that used to be a hallowed space of privilege uh, changes the character of the space while uh, not depriving it of that history. And just creating um, ways for students to interact with the space and to take ownership of it. And a big moment in the stairwell, you can see it from outside the center. So the next project is also for Princeton University. Um, this is a little bit more recent. They had a new building um, that was a renovation and new construction. On the left was the home of the economics department. On the right was the international programs where an exterior courtyard had been converted into an interior atrium with programs all, all around. And uh, the client, the international programs, wanted uh, more of an identity to that space that, that basically uh, was much more welcoming to people. And so this is what the atrium looked like. There was going to be this artwork, a vertically oriented artwork in the space. And they asked us to do something that was a bit more explicit in how it would welcome people and signal that Princeton is a, an international a university with a national scope, but also welcoming of international people. And so we started looking at and researching some of the ways that international students had arrived. And initially um, the focus was really on how you know, with any new arrival, whether it was women or people of color or international um, students, it was really just, it was really like, how can they benefit the education of our main constituency, which historically was white men. But over the years, it became a lot more um, inclusive um, and more authentic in that inclusion. And we also looked at other ways of talking about the international experience and, and displaying that obviously, you know, there's the flags and like we're looking at cliches of like putting up a map of the world and we didn't want to do any of these things. We didn't want to have like welcome in different languages. Um, so how do you create something that feels sophisticated, that feels welcoming and also fits the, the new architecture? And so we had this idea of a, of a banner that would take up the, the void within the atrium and it would be hung from the ceiling and would have a quote on it that would let people know that this was this place was about kind of exploration and learning and the international experience. 
and we built a model to show what it would feel like. It would be constantly changing from different directions and it would feel totally different from anything on campus at the moment. And this would be the quote that would be on it. Yet all experience is an archway through gleams that untraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever when I move. And then we heard that, oh, you know, wait a minute. The architect said that there are these exhaust fans that in the case of fire, or even in the case of a fire drill, would basically suck this thing out of the building. Uh, and so it was completely not viable. And this was months into the project. So at that point, we went back to the drawing board and we started thinking about what else we could do in that space. And we started thinking about a floor installation. And for it, we were looking at circles as something that occur in all cultures and often signify the celestial. You can see examples of that here and here. And we were looking at ways in which uh, floor installations have been done before. Like, this is something we take from the architecture kind of discipline. We always look at precedent and ways on building on what has been done before. And so again, you can see in different cultures, these floor installations that can be really quite uh, dramatic, but also ethereal sometimes. And so we presented two options. There was a celestial and a terrestrial that had more of these geographic kind of uh, lines. And they picked the circles, the option of the circles um, and the arcs. And it took up 7,200 square feet on three different levels. And it was to be kind of embed typography and lines and dotted lines embedded within the floor. And you can see what a close up of that design here. It has quotations from authors from all around the world. And here is an image showing one of the meetings in the space where the design and the application was being approved and the samples were being checked. And it's essentially silver vinyl, vinyl that goes onto the porcelain tile. And then there's a layer of epoxy that seals it in, but it also turns the tile in, into a super glossy finish. And so you have to put another layer, this time of polyurethane, that then restores the matte appearance of the tile. And you can see images of the installation taking place because this was gonna be sealed in pretty much forever. And then we had to make sure that everything was exactly right. There was no spelling errors. And once the vinyl was all in, you're seeing the epoxy being applied. And this is what it looked like even after the epoxy dried. And then here you can see it with the polyurethane. And uh, it's, it's quite nice because there's always something new to discover as you're walking through the space and to get inspired by. And it does what the client wanted, which was to uh, like have an explicit signaling of the international, the idea of the international, while also making it uh, not um, an obstruction to the, to the artwork that was in the space. So it, it was a project that got us thinking a lot more about how do, how do visual identities turn into building identities to signal the, the, the mission of institutions. So that led to a project at the Museum of the City of New York, which was much more explicitly an exhibit. And it was our first exhibit in New York City in 2018. Um, and it was a huge sort of, you know, point of pride to finally be able to work in the city that we live in uh, here and also tell the story of that city. And here is called Germ City Microbes in the Metropolis, a story that told uh, the, the history of New York City through the public health lens. And, um, you know, so they wanted to display things like the iron lung, which helps people breathe. Helped. Uh, helped people time breathe. Ago. Uh, sorry. Yeah. And then like artworks like on the right um, by Jordan Eagles, which is a blood mirror, uh, basically um, made from the blood of gay men to protest uh, the federal government's discrimination against their HIV, uh, presumed HIV status. And uh, the artifacts that kind of looks pretty creepy. <laughs> it's kind of scary. I saw on the upper left-hand corner, you can see a wax melage of a dead boy from smallpox. And uh, like our initial reaction was like, oh, how are we gonna display this in a way that's family friendly? And this was back when germs were acute and uh, non-threatening and people weren't like sort of afraid for their lives because of pandemic, but we were talking about pandemics. And so um, a lot of vocabulary uh, 
we learned then is now really relevant now. Um, but essentially, they want to talk about cities' response to these, particularly the scapegoating of immigrants, um, of queer people, and uh, people of color um, during a pandemic. And yeah, and women. So uh, essentially, we just think about, well, how do you put these in a context where families and kids can uh, still feel safe um, and yet like sort of teach them something? And so we thought about uh, while well, creating a public space based on Japanese architecture here by Jun Ishigami, which already looked like microbes um, and was, were also kind of cute. Uh, and here, sort of the architectural diagrams by Andrea Bronzi about the, the urbanism um, of Italy. Mm -hmm. And so basically thinking about like sort of showing basic schemes of what it could be, for example, a bunch of like gridded tables with um, micro tables moving around them, or could it be a bunch of little micro tables? Um, this was, they thought was cool, but like pretty non-functional because they wanted to group things by theme and to have sort of um, education about various city responses. And then this was even cooler, which is like one one table, because usually you go into a museum about the city and it's all about the verticality of the city or the grittedness of the city. And here it was about the indiscriminate nature of the diffusion of microbes in space. Um, but the table was too thin, it couldn't really hold objects. So like making the lobes bigger some, somehow seemed to make sense. And each lobe would correspond to a theme that could also be reflected on the adjacent wall. And here, so here was an evolution of that or a proof of concept, like putting um, uh, objects of very different scales and types in that space of that table. Here was the highly evolved version later on where like the, all the tons of various objects were corresponding to various themes and positioned very carefully with respect to each other. Um, here's like mini, and then like graphic design for exhibits tends to be much less contentious. Like once you get the architectural design approved, they're mostly concentrating on that and the graphic can be basically anything. And so we proposed various different schemes that we modeled here with little tiny models. And um, here is a, you know, it's on a metric, is that the correct word? <laughs> Sorry, um, it's showing sort of the table design. Um, and the graphic identity was trying to sort of comp that idea, not directly using the uh, shape of the table, but instead thinking about like the idea of that microbes don't obey the laws of, um, of the city. Usually uh, they kind of transgress the grid and they stretch and they transform and they mutate. Um, yeah, and again, this is when germs were cute. So like the, <laughs> the identity was cute rather than scary. And that's what we kind of might see it now. Uh, and here's unfolded elevations with the floor plan and um, the museum was really excited by like putting a big blue floor where and then the gradient paint up the walls where it could diffuse up the walls. And so here's a sort of images of how we showed how every object would be positioned. There would be reproductions and um, you know original artifacts under plexi cases, some with desk and chambers, uh, all um, sort of within the space of one one architectural structure, which we thought was quite elegant. Um, and then they asked us to do a second gallery because the first gallery was like stuff you couldn't touch, right, as a visitor. So they thought, well, what if we make a second gallery where people can actually interact with the objects and like sort of, you know, play games and bring their kids and have fun. And so we thought like, okay, it could be a linear table. It could be a library with a serpentine bookshelf and it could be little micro tables and, or it could be a peripheral table like this in this long um, condition. Uh, they chose the little micro tables, which was like the baby tables of the mama table in the other room. And there was uh, various activities that, you know, uh, people could respond to the exhibit with. And so everybody was like super, uh, like um, had, had a lot of fun and it was, it was super um, sort of enjoyable at that point. And they asked us to test some of this. So how would you paint a whole gallery with this gradient paint? They've never done it before. Um, and to show how like the tables could be CNC cut on these um, pre-existing hairpin legs. Um, and uh, that they would work. And then we painted the whole gallery. And the table was brought in and in pieces and then assembled. And it was kind of a magical moment because uh, when they were in pieces, we thought, oh, this is way, way too big. People were saying it's too big for the room. And when it kind of all came together, it lifted off the ground and the very thin knife edge profile of the table made everything feel seamless and light. And with exhibitions, we always take measurements of the as-built condition to make sure that the design, especially if it's something so calculated with ADA that it's gonna fit. Yeah, and so basically thinking about like how uh, people's entrance into the exhibit here and immediately you get a little like sort of germ bench you could sit on and watch some films about like the, the way that the language around disease has been built up over time. Um, what uh, this graph that the city issues called the conquest of pestilence, basically how the city's efforts have made deaths go down. And unfortunately this graph will be quite different, you know, given the coronavirus pandemic. And you go to the main gallery and you get this immersive space, almost like a lab-like environment 
where um, you're exploring a lot of these stories with super graphics on the ground, on the floor, uh, and various different objects, sort of past and present, uh, comparing um, basically how uh, the, the city has worked historically with how it works today. You encounter these art objects, um, quarantine signs, uh, here talking about Typhoid Mary and where she was sort of imprisoned, or like various, uh, like um, in the upper right hand corner, there's an object called a button hook, which was used to uh, sort of check immigrants um, under their eyes uh, at Ellis Island to see if um, you know they were carrying disease. And a lot of it is like the underpinnings of how, um, uh, like for example, here images showing contact tracing in its infancy, how the city is um, dealing with uh, responding to the pandemic, but oftentimes exacerbating the problems associated with scapegoating particular groups of people. And so it's not new. Um, the, the quote China virus is just the latest manifestation of like crude vocabulary that suppresses people. But also um, the city has long cared for its population. And there are various different uh, sort of artifacts that show, you know, for example, the iron lung here, or uh, here are the postcards, a grid of postcards that show all the various hospitals in New York City and the amazing work that they do. Um, a tubercular lung uh, showing like sort of, you know, this, um, an artifact that shows like a lung infected by tuberculosis. And then here are some images of the reading room where people could sort of sit down, re relax at the time, uh, sort of uh, offer a response, you know, play with their kids. Um, some of the um, testimonials that people gave about their experiences with infectious disease were really moving and offered, um, you know, even uh, us as designers context to how people felt. So this is a project that we did in late 2018, early 2019 uh, with Google. And the project was essentially, uh, Google wanted to educate their team, their employees on the black experience with police in America. And uh, as you can imagine, it's a, very, um, it's a very sensitive and very complex and nuanced topic. And so when we entered the project, they shared with us some research that they had been doing for for a year or two, I think. And they had been meeting with a lot of people and creating these PowerPoint slides. And we were a little concerned because they seemed almost like a pseudoscientific, bureaucratic kind of presentation and didn't really capture the visceral stories that we thought deserved to be told, especially in the light of the Black Lives Matter movement. And some of them were almost offensive, like this slide that said how not to get shot and, and really putting the putting their responsibility on the Black American community uh, on when encounters do take place with the police um, and not, not looking so much into how police is supposed to be a public service and that serves all citizens equally, right? So we said, uh, would it be possible to have us meet some of your participants and kind of re-interview them and re-photograph them? Because as you'll notice, the photographs also look kind of like mugshots. They don't look very dignified or beautiful in the way that the photography is done. So we wanted to do that. And so they said, okay. And we traveled to three cities, Atlanta, Georgia, Oakland, California, and Washington, DC. And we met with nine people and it was a very diverse group working and living in different kinds of neighborhoods and working in different you know, technology, et cetera, et cetera. And we visited their homes and their workplaces and talked to them, recorded the interviews. And it was very insightful and very moving because these were not people who you see on the news. Um, they were people that went about their daily lives, but in uh, even though everything else in their life was very unique and diverse, the one common thing was negative encounters with the police. And so people told stories of that and just being viewed as a threat you know, by a public officer. So Laura, for example, said, I would tell the mother of a police officer that a lot of the feelings that she may have about black males being aggressive and being a threat, I would say a lot of that is sensationalized. I would tell her that my sons are human, they're loved, they're smart, they're intelligent, they're gifted. And especially talking to the men, they would often uh, use humor in recounting some of the stories because that was a, we thought that was a way of, you know, taking back control in a situation that might have been humiliating. And uh, people talked about the very stark difference that when they were with their white friends and stopped by the police, uh, they would see the interactions would be totally different. Like there was a sense of confidence, even entitlement uh, of, yeah, I deserve this protection, you know, from their white counterparts. But they felt that they weren't afforded that same level of um, uh, confidence in that, in that 
uh, encounter. And we visited people's, uh, you know, the, uh, after work, this, uh, uh, this person would go and play music. And so this was the warehouse where, where that was. And we started thinking about the exhibit and, you know, what form it could take. It would be in the headquarters at Google in New York. And we looked at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And we started looking at this idea of the public square, which is quite important in American history. And, you know, a site of trauma where it would have been the site of slave auctions in the past, and also a place where the American story is kind of told and retold and negotiated. Here you're seeing the set of the musical Hamilton. And a place where public messages are put out. And as a society, we kind of decide together what are the ideals that are enshrined and what are things that we reject. And we looked at typography from the civil rights era and different ways of composing design and type. And we looked at some more contemporary typography. Here on the left, you're seeing vocal type, which is led by Trey Seals, a black uh, typography designer. And in terms of the architecture of the exhibit, we had two options. And the one they liked was this one, which is essentially, um, plywood panels that hold each other up and together create a community space in the center. And you can see that the exhibit is not just about policing, but it really starts with everyday life and the kinds of discrimination that takes place in institutions in everyday encounters and how policing then becomes a natural, almost inevitable outcome of that. And then ends with, um, you know, ideas of coping, how people find hope, a space for personal reflection, and then a community table where together the Google community could come uh, to this space and surrounded by these graphics, there would be a conceptual shift in which new kinds of conversations could take place and people could update their understanding of, uh, of this condition. Um, here is a physical model that, you know, as you can see, we do a lot of physical models. Uh, it helps us get everybody on the same page and everybody excited about what the, what the vision for the exhibit is. And then we had one day to install. You can see an image of that here. We did direct printed plywood panels and on wood framing, pretty simple construction um, and then stabilized with steel wires as well. It was a little, a little more tricky than it looks, but it was exciting to kind of create. <laughs> Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven rings Ring with the harmony Of liberty Let our rejoicing rise So you can see some photographs of the exhibit here. And uh, you know, these, we thought the portraits were really nice, kind of larger than life in the space and a real encounter with the people and their lives. And we really wanted to include elements from literary culture, as well as history, in order to make sure that the stories from these participants were grounded and to, to kind of convey that the problem is systemic and it's pervasive and it's not just one or two people's stories, but it's a, it's a 
it's a story that is uh, prevalent throughout the country and rooted in history. For example, the history of redlining. And some of those quotations were really powerful in the space as well, telling the history of policing, how it emerged from slave catching or protecting land uh, from Native Americans. And kind of seeing kind of the rhythm of history kind of, uh, you know, of progress, but also moments at which the, uh, the darker side of history resurfaces. And just difficult conversations that like moms would have to have with their kids to prepare them for a potential encounter. Um, and, uh, and the folks at Google also asked us to make posters to show the various emotions that somebody might go through, especially a person of color, um, when they're shot by the police. And uh, you know, this idea that you have to get your license and registration out before, uh, you know, in the in like the minute or so that you stop with your hands on the steering wheel in order to ensure that there is not even a hint of um, a confusion, like any like ambiguity for the police that might endanger your life. And you can see a space for personal reflection. And a space for community uh, discourse. And this was the opening event where they invited some of the participants to share some of their stories and talk more about the whole project. So this next project is about our own community or like sort of talking about ourselves as an Asian American community. And I think it's been really hard, at least like personally, to even take ownership of that participation. I feel, feel like uh, there's been a fear of like, being labeled a Chinatown design firm or some like some, some uh, being taken down a peg because of our race. Uh, but recently, and in light of like, the last 24 hours, especially thinking about like how we're proud of that and that pride should be expressed in visual culture on the same level as any other sort of, you know, um, culture. So we did this project called Rule of Thirds, uh, working with a Brooklyn restaurant group uh, who wanted to start a new restaurant that was trying to sort of, you know, um, create a, a space that melded like Brooks, Brooklyn hipsterism with uh, with um, you know Jap Japanese culture, and it was really fun in the sense that like creating an identity that's just based on the sense of joy and welcoming. Um, and th this uh, place is only a couple of um, blocks away from us in uh, near our studio at home, and to create something that you know at once uh, feels like it's um, connected to an artistic tradition, and uh, and th these are photos of the the restaurant. It was uh, the architecture was done by Studio Love Is Enough. And, but to create the visual system that um, you know had a sense of joy and humor, uh, where a lot of our work tends to be very serious, um, so to be able to take a break from that and make something that was just about like you know expressing um, you know food culture and uh, like to think about these cool and fun illustrations um, and explaining, for example, here are the different choices of how you serve sochu. Um, yeah, like thinking about how this visual identity could really uplift um, this neighborhood uh, restaurant bars. Yeah, and I, I think it's kind of, um, for me as, as a designer, you know, maybe realize that like the same formal skills applied to things that are sort of serious social causes can be applied, you know, with as much dexterity and like sort of passion to things that we just love and want to want to support in our own neighborhoods. I mean, for example, a choking poster uh, with one of the co-founders, um, you know, being the person who is being relieved of choking. Here's some of the signage applications. Um, and we're, we're on our last couple of projects, I think now, right? Um, so the next project is for the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. And the exhibition was called Contemporary Muslim Fashions. Uh, this is a very like prestigious museum in New York. And so it was, a, it, was a, it was like this amazing opportunity for us to work with them as part of the Smithsonian. And uh, the topic was pretty close to home as well. I grew up in a Muslim family and so I both wanted to think about how we can help mediate 
how the story of Muslims is told to a like a wider audience in New York with dignity, because oftentimes, you know, people um, and especially politicians will scapegoat or paint with a very broad brush and label all Muslims as terrorists. And but it's a very it's a very diverse community and a very nuanced community. So how do we show that? And then on the other hand, within the Muslim community, you know, the struggles are the same as any other community, whether it's gender equality, there's LGBT acceptance, um, you know, income inequality, all of those things. So how could we talk about those more openly as well and engage the community? So the exhibit had opened initially at the De Young Museum, and this is what the design had looked like over there. Um, we had not designed that exhibit. They had a much higher ceiling and the focus was very much on fashion and kind of the um, uh, the glamour of fashion. And we wanted in New York, the museum and our studio wanted to do something a little different and to focus a little bit more on the social context of that fashion because it included pieces for like the Queen of Qatar, but it also had pieces that were uh, street fashion and protest pieces that were talking about gender inequality in within the Islamic religion. Here's some more images of the one in San Francisco. And our project began by taking stock of all of the objects that were supposed to go into the exhibit. Um, so we create a, a visual index where everything is in scale to everything else. And also taking a look at some architectural precedents. So we really liked the Cordoba Mosque, which is a pretty important architectural precedent. And it's got a pretty boring plan where you have like just a grid that keeps expanding. But the experience is interesting because in elevation you have these arches and it conveys a kind of equality and the value of equality that is supposed to be upheld in the, in the religion. And we also looked at um, the Long Museum in Shanghai as a great example of a contemporary use of arches where you use half arches to create a space that is constantly dynamic in the ways that it is framing views within the architecture. And we looked at exhibits at the, Metro uh, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, translucent material and typography on that as well. And for the graphic design, we used a typeface that's very contemporary, that indicates fashion, but we turned the eyes, the dots of the eyes, um, you know, rotated them 45 degrees to have, uh, to signal kind of the Arabic language a little bit. Also understanding that Arabic is not the only language um, that Muslims uh, speak and, and read and write in. You can see some of the pieces that were in the exhibit. Pretty much from all over the world. Most of the artists and designers featured were under 30. So uh, it was really a young group of people, like sort of re 35, reinventing sort of um, what uh, the uh, Muslim culture is represented as on the international stage. And we use color as a way to define the sections within the exhibit. So here is what the, the gallery looked like. I think it was 4,500 or 5,000 square feet. So quite large, but as you can see, there's a lot of obstructions and the ceiling was quite low. So how do you get so many objects in there? And there was also a requirement of a three foot touch distance where no object could be within three feet of like where people could walk. So that presented an added challenge, but also created a much more open um, and uh, yeah, looking exhibit at the end. So here you can see uh, we presented three options. This is the one that they chose. And it has a combination of three main architectural elements. There are the half arches that divide up the space in, into rooms, essentially. Then there are the um, curved platforms that create room within the exhibit for the, for the mannequins, but also create a flow through it that allows people to walk and experience everything. And finally, we had the, the labels that followed the, that were each of them was custom and they followed the curve of the platforms. You can see all three of those elements represented here. And we got very uh, detailed about like how tall these panels of these platforms were gonna be and what the construction of these uh, arches was gonna be to make them as fine as possible. 
And the Smithsonian requires like a 60 page construction set, <laughs> which is was the first time that our studio has done like a real construction set. And, you know, we hired our first architectural designer, but it was a, it was really a fun project and uh, it was a great learning experience for us. You can see some of the details of the various elements here. I mean, we work a lot with architects. We do a lot of signage and refining projects now. So we do, uh, so we, we deal with construction sets and this was interesting. Each of the arches was also completely unique because of the space and everything had to be measured on site. Uh, then we uh, worked with new project in Brooklyn to create prototypes. And we also worked with ColorX to look at um, how the vinyl would be applied both to the walls and also to the fabric. And here you can see some images of the construction in progress. And it was a lot of work for them to make sure that the platforms were seamless. There's Andy. Uh, and then the, the arches came in and the fabric went on. And you could start to see kind of the vision of like these half arches creating um, whole completed arches in, in three dimensional space. And yeah, the, the, the fashion that was shown was really beautiful as well. So the design had to be quite, um, it had to take on a secondary role to the fashion and to the, to the, to the dresses that were displayed. You see the use of color here. When the exhibition opened. Oh yeah, the exhibit opened two weeks before the pandemic caused New York to completely shut down. So it remains kind of, it's there, but it's suspended in kind of time and space and nobody can see it because the museum has not really reopened yet. Um, and we're hoping that it will be extended so people can experience it when it does open. Yeah, so it's interesting how fashion becomes a way for people to express themselves, but also a way of being um, in, in, their, in their communities and uh, asserting their personality. And this idea of like who covers their head and who doesn't, it's really left to the viewer to kind of decide, or, you know, what they think about that. So the last project we want to present is called Happy Family Night Market. It's a sort of a, a festival about the Asian diaspora in New York City and uh, expressed through sort of food culture, obviously, as are night markets. If you've been to, like, for example, here, this image is of Taipei. And um, night markets are a huge tradition in Asian countries, like the idea of coming together and coalescing around food, especially pre-COVID. And here you can see that throughout um, the entirety of Asia, here on uh, the left images from India or on the right images of Japan. Um, and that culture has really extended to the United States, but although become more commodified because immigrant business owners just need to sort of make um, a living. And so you can see here, like the signage aesthetic is usually thought of as kind of tawdry and low class. But for us, it became an inspiration to think about like how um, we should celebrate this story of immigrant survival. And um, like that the, the strip malls where I grew up, you know, in that first image that we showed, um, become um, a, a place of celebration and something that we should honor. Uh, as a culture. Um, and so that became um, like a basis for an identity that was based around these stickers, which came in all these different languages, recognizing the main um, Asian languages spoken in New York City. And uh, you know, here's a, a monogram. And then the system was further extended with this idea of like, sort of folding and unfolding, the idea of uh, taking the two dimensional and turning it three dimensional as a metaphor and talk about like the complexity of Asian cultures. Usually, like people kind of um, exoticize Asians, label people uh, as all the same, as opposed to looking at the nuances of all the cultures. And yet, like there's not much unity among Asian cultures as well, because we kind of all fragment and tend to sort of you know, go into our silos as a way of protecting ourselves. But here, an opportunity for everybody to come together. Uh, and uh, to declare uh, in a, a public space that, you know, uh, uh, this kind of celebration is important and common to us all. So 
Yeah, so it was a lot of fun. And then um, it was really interesting because they didn't have much of a budget. And so here was a mock-up of what we wanted to do with the space. Of course, they couldn't really afford like a, a lift to get up that high and so forth. But um, the applications ended up being really joyful. And the graphics really did sort of change uh, this Abrams Art Center, which is a modernist space into a space of um, relaxation and joy, you know, and just to see everybody coming together and to see like languages like Urdu and um, sort of, you know, our own languages uh, take up space was really sort of moving. I think like uh, we hope to do more of this kind of work um, where it's a little bit less reverent and more about just like uh, this kind of ecstatic, joyful expression. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, that was amazing. Um, so now we're gonna go into um, a Q&A time. And we have a question here from Mark Stanley. He says, thank you Vukas and Andy for an excellent talk. I very much appreciate the depth and nuance of your work, especially on complex and sensitive issues. I think there's an equal intelligence in the types of commissions and clients you have garnered. Could you describe how you cultivated those relationships or how you got early commissions? Yeah, so this is a, that's a really great question. And, uh, you know, one thing we didn't get to show was what happened before that USAID project, which was a year that Andy spent with a different business partner at the beginning of Isometric Studio. And, uh, and even before that, um, when he was in grad school, he got advice from, can I share this story? <laughs> from Paula Share that, if you have three clients of your own uh, freelance, then you can go ahead and just create your own studio. And uh, so Andy in grad school worked with nonprofits and did kind of sometimes a barter system where he said, okay, you can have the design for free, but let me travel to Kenya and Uganda so I can go and like take pictures and really create a beautiful visual identity. Um, and so those early projects were maybe not the glamorous and you know, there wasn't always the choice on which project to take and which to, to refuse. Um, but, but I think there was a lot of struggle there, right? And if you want to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, it was hard because <laughs> like, we're not like born into families with a whole lot of connections or neither had we worked at like offices for a very long time and cultivated a lot of relationships. But um, like, I, I, I will say that like, uh, you know, those early projects um, would sort of establish a methodology around what our values are and to think about a, a process of trying to arrive at you know, good design that, that serves people. Um, but I think that like later on, once it came to the USAID project, certainly like a professor contacted um, me, like a friend and professor, and that became a connection to a, a bigger client. Um, and in that scenario, when Andrew Fryband got in touch with us, he wanted to meet for a drink. And so we went and he told us about the project and we discussed like how we could send a proposal. He was kind of our ally in that situation and that was really helpful. And uh, he said, okay, why don't you give me two proposals? One is just for the exhibit and one is for the whole space. And we did, hadn't really done an exhibit like that before. So we kind of made up some of the numbers, but we wanted to just make sure that we're safe in case we actually get the project. We wanna make sure we can deliver. So we made some phone calls. We came up with the numbers and sent an email. And then the next day they said that they were interested. And so we were on our way to DC. So that's how that one got started. And we had a real like ally in that situation. Yeah, and even though we went to a school like Princeton, like, you know, like they didn't automatically approach us to do any design because like it almost felt like you had to prove that you could do this thing at a high level before people could re would reach out to you and trust you. Um, and so I think that like um, one thing that I felt is with each project really like, um, caring for it and thinking about how this can be the best thing ever, even if it's like um, something that isn't particularly glamorous, for example, like branding for a startup that you don't particularly care about what they're doing. <laughs> but like, you're just thinking about, well, okay, how can this employ some of the same tools of storytelling that you would apply to something that you actually do care about? And, um, and then people can detect in that kind of sincerity, I think, and a kind of a methodology that they resonate with. And some of the early projects we really st struggled with, like we worked with a lot of startups, and sometimes I would just get fed up and I would say, can we just compromise on this one? And the next one can be like the really beautiful project. And Andy would always say like, no, like what we make in this one is gonna determine what we get next. So we can't, we can't like not do a good job on even in this, this terrible project. And I think that was really a useful lesson because now we get our projects based on what we've done, 
you know, the year before or the year before. So now it's almost like a rolling basis. We keep getting new projects. And I think that early decision to kind of set the standard was an important uh, one. And, you know, it kept us kind of accountable. Awesome. Um, we have another question from Jason Young. He asks, do you consider your practice a counterpoint to institutionality? So many times you pointed out how an institution was headed down the wrong path with the project and now you help them redirect. Is this a conscious part of how you think about your work and how did you prepare for such a role? Do you wanna go first? So I think that um, unlike a lot of architects, like, you know, we hear these like heroic stories of Ram Kulhas, like taking on a project and then doing something totally like opposite of what the brief was. We don't do that. We want to make sure that we are fully aligned with the institution that we partner with before we take on the project, at least in terms of the ultimate like goals. So if somebody comes to us and says, I want to like hurt puppies or something similar, we're going to be like, um, maybe we're not the right partnership, right? But once we do take an, on the project, and you know, our proposal tends to be quite, uh, every proposal is completely unique and it's a written version of what we think conceptually they should be doing. So it's a way of testing the waters. Um, and once we do take on the project, yeah, we oftentimes inspire a course correction. It's usually about design. It's about bringing our design briefcase and saying, you know, you want us to do this, Here's how we think you can do that in the best possible way. Here are things you wanna be aware of. Like you don't wanna show people in these compromised positions or you don't wanna like go against your own values, right? So in many ways we're holding up a mirror and saying here are the tools and techniques that we can bring to the project that can help you realize your own vision. Um, I think in gen this generation, like moral ambivalence is not an option. And so I think that, um, you know, very often it's, if, if we just feel like uncomfortable with the way something's being sort of said, or uh, even if it's not really in our purview, if it's in the content purview, we'll be like, hmm, uh, do you really want to be saying that? You know, because that's how this comes across to us. And I'm sure that the institution doesn't want to be racist. Right. So, I mean, I, I think that I mean, usually it's not as explicit as that, but I, I, very often there's a lot of gray area. And we try to begin by giving people the benefit of the doubt that, you know, everybody's trying to do the right thing, but that they, um, there are, everybody has blind spots, including us. And like, you know, we can talk about it as a more, um, I guess, intimate sharing of our values and like, you know, talk about instead of a, like a threatening accusation. But um, sometimes it does come down to like, if we do this this way, it's going to actually um, cause the institution a lot of problems, right? And these are things that you may not have considered that we're bringing to you. And here is the alternative that you can achieve through design, right? And we can bring our expertise to help you um, elevate the level of the discourse so it doesn't fall into those easy traps. And I think that that often gives people both like a summary of the problem and a way out. And um, I think that, uh, you know, even if it's uncomfortable, um, it's something that we feel pretty strongly about. Mm -hmm. And we have some basic like ground rules, like if you get an email late at night that's really troubling, you not, don't respond to it until the following day. <laughs> so little things like that, uh, calling people in, like if there is a really serious thing, like is there somebody you can get on the phone with to talk rather than sending like a condemning email to a large group and kind of embarrassing them in front of their like, you know, peers. So those kinds of like human techniques uh, are really useful in the work. Yeah, that was really insightful, thank you. Um, Samantha has a question. She said, thank you for sharing your stories and processes. I feel like I have a lot to think about with how to respectfully design for different lived experiences. I'm really interested in the exhibition spaces y'all have designed to inspire conversation. Do you have any advice for students who are interested in creating those spaces at their own universities? Yeah, I mean, I think I would approach, you know, whoever's uh, sort of in charge of that, like whether it's like, you know, the dean of the school or whatever, just set up a meeting and say like, well, um, these spaces may be kind of blank and are really an opportunity where you know, we could signal um, a certain kind of values about you know, ourselves and we can tell stories. And these can be done in ways that are changeable, meaning that doesn't have to be like something permanent, but um, like applied graphics or whatever, they can always change. Um, and I would just like sort of propose that and say like, you know, uh, here's some thoughts about like what, what kind of change I would like to see. 
um, and maybe bring a couple of people together uh, and say we can convene a couple of different voices to make sure this is aligned with the goals of a broader community. So I think it's um, approaching it from a point of view of like abundance that schools generally want this kind of work. And um, our, so there's a hunger right now for designers to engage in the kind of conversation and then trying to just think about like, what is the most, um, the best opportunity, you know, uh, in terms of uh, existing architecture to, to build upon it. And rather than like having to tear anything down, like think about like, how can we make spaces that are anonymous and maybe um, don't have uh, a sense of like, sort of, you know, a clear um, agenda about like sort of expressing values and use design to, um, to create that space, that space of belonging. Yeah, and I'll also add that, you know, we think about these kinds of spaces as uh, safe spaces, but also challenging spaces because they challenge uh, the kinds of conversations that take place there, right? And they challenge you to think deeper about some of the social issues. So one resource that we look at uh, looked at a lot, especially at the beginning, is the SEGD, Society of Exper for Experiential Graphic Design. And they have a lot of, this is a fairly new field of putting graphic design in architectural spaces. But I think one that's growing really fast because a lot of institutions wanna be, wanna be able to tell the stories of the work that they're doing in the spaces. And that can be very inspiring and very empowering for, uh, for communities to come together. Awesome. Um, I have a question. Uh, what, does your um, process look like, especially like in the beginning phases of the idea of the project? Um, like, and what do you look towards to for like inspiration? So one of the first things, so I already mentioned the proposal, which is really the first thing we do even before we get a project. Um, and the proposal also lists like a scope of work, um, all the different things we would be providing, a budget, a timeline, and, so once we get the project, the first thing we do is an inspiration benchmarking meeting. And sometimes we call it a research workshop. And in this meeting, we prepare a pretty extensive presentation of existing case studies that we think are relevant to that project. So for example, we're doing a museum identity right now. And so we look at a lot of, a lot of museum identities, both historical as well as contemporary. And we put those case studies in there. And uh, of course we wanna kind of curate that experience in the direction that we want them to go, but have enough variation for them to be able to react to that. And a lot of communities are really good with words and expressing their values in words, but the minute you show them an image, they can get a lot more specific and kind of agree on the spectrum of where they want their design to be. So that is super helpful both uh, practically in how we get that information early on, but also strategically because people feel heard and then they feel like they're part of the design process. And then we do two to three options, no more than three, because we want all the options to be really good and different enough. And uh, we want people to be able to focus and pick one or a synthesis thereof. And uh, so there's like a pretty like nice rhythm of like three weeks, you get the concept presentation, and then we give them time. Now we've learned we want to give them a week to sit with it and give us synthesized feedback because we don't want to rush that process. And then we do a revised presentation. And then we do the draft deliverables, depending on what it is, you know, how the time will differ. And then we go into, you know, pro, like final deliverables, production, stuff like that. And within the studio, I don't know if you want to talk about that, maybe like how we work within the studio. <laughs> I can say a little bit about that. So like we're seven people now and we pretty much everybody works on all the projects and we use Dropbox and we share files and it's super collaborative. It's, you know, we did, especially in architecture school, I had collaborative projects, which was good to kind of get me prepared a little bit, but in the workplace, like everything is a lot more collaborative and there's a, we try, we try to create a culture where everybody's work is valued and upheld and we have protocols around how we give feedback which is we always start with something positive even if it's like somebody's having a really bad like graphic design day or architecture day and we see what we see in front of us is they're really bad we want to start with something positive because again like i said strategically it really helps make the person feel like their work is valued even if you say like thank you for your work 
now here are all the things that are wrong and I want you to, want you to do it differently. I think that those kinds of protocols really help us in our process. So, yeah. All right, that's awesome. Uh, we just have one more question and then we'll wrap things up. Um, Julie says, thank you both. Your focus, your job, your work focuses on such loaded and poignant topics that are ripe with lots of contact and lots of emotion. In exhibition design, the stories are told primarily through the content where the architecture and the graphics complement and support the story. As a designer, do you ever grapple with the desire for a more open interpretation of the subject matter? Meaning have more curatorial control so that the content can complement the space? Or do you have any curatorial control? It depends on the project. Like if it's a museum, they typically have like curators who have very strong opinions and like that their own way of doing things. But even then, like I feel like design is its own form of authorship and there's ways of shaping the content to kind of match um, what our own preferences and values are. But uh, for example, a project like Google or USA, like those clients had no idea how to organize an exhibit. Um, and uh, so a lot of the structure and even the writing came from us, you know, and we did like a lot of the research and uh, the content creation itself. So I would say that there's a good balance of those different kinds of projects. Um, and sometimes there's a lot of very literal authorship. Of course, like we don't get credit for that typically, but there's like, um, like uh, I, I would say it's, it's a substantial contribution to the work of these institutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome, okay, just one more quick question. Um, our graphic design director, Sarah Lowe, she asks you all, um, with everything that you've learned to date in your practice, would you go back, what would you go back and tell your former undergraduate designer selves? So when I was an undergraduate, I had a seminar with a professor, uh, his name was Jeff Kipnis. And uh, it was a very conversational seminar and it was a really great learning experience, but he really delighted in making people feel embarrassed. Um, and one thing he did, he told us that out of a class of like 20 or so, like most of us were actually not gonna be architects, but we would be doing something totally different just based on like what he knew of our undergraduate program. And uh, at the moment I felt like that is so wrong. And why is he saying that? I wanna be an architect, architect. And uh, now I realize like he was right. And that's something to celebrate because you know, the world is changing a lot. And uh, oftentimes you are presented with um, a fork in the road or an opportunity. And sometimes it's too risky, right? You don't wanna risk everything to take it. And sometimes it's a more calculated risk. Like, you know, there are safeguards against complete and utter failure. And in that case, sometimes it is helpful to take a different track and kind of see how your particular uh, background, expertise, interest, uh, and passion can serve some an, an alternate like discipline. And uh, and what I've noticed is it's it's really great when you come to a different discipline, you bring a fresh perspective. You're constantly curious and learning. And uh, some of our best architectural decisions come from Andy. And I would say some of our best graphic design, you know, analysis comes from me because I didn't go to school for that. So that's one thing that I think I, I, would, I would tell my former self is that just be open to something different than the expected path. Um, I think like I, I was a sociology major and I had no ambitions to become a designer professionally because like I didn't design kind of like as a, extracurricular and mostly thought like I, I was like good at like the the business side of it and not like particularly good at the aesthetic side and because I had been told that also my life that like I'm a terrible visual artist like I got C's and D's in visual art growing up and my parents were like stunned and they were like you know this takes talent <laughs> like um, are you sure um and I think I would tell my former self that um that design is one of those really interesting um, fields that you can just define for yourself what you want to do. And of course, there's some precedence in terms of the level of like visual quality something needs to have in order to succeed commercially or like you know, in, in society. But I think that those are somewhat arbitrary and fungible as well. So just to kind of like invoke things that um, matter to you and to focus on uh, the kind of um, thing that you feel joy doing every day because like um, design particularly is a very tough field. Um, it's something that requires like a constant renewal of creativity uh, for each project and to reset your expectations every time you encounter a new client. And a largely a, it's a client-based service um, profession for the uh, most part. So it requires like 
coordination and also respect of a lot of different points of view and individuals. And I think that um, knowing that what I know now, it's like, you know, I wish I had more patience as a, as a undergraduate. I wish I like weren't so like sort of um, intent on having to define like a career path back then. Um, and I think like Vikas said, like an openness that like life is um, full of change. And sometimes that change can really lead to unexpected and wonderful surprises. And life is long. <laughs> when I was an undergrad, I felt like I had to do everything in the next like, two years or something. But life is so long and you get to do so much. So there's time to explore and really figure out stuff. Awesome. Well, this has been really amazing. Thank you so much, Rakas and Andy, for coming. Um, thank you all for tuning in. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Have a good night.